All right. Hello, I'm Lydia Ng, I'm Senior Director of Technology. Uh, thank you for that terrific talk. Uh, next, we have our second team talk uh, from a group of individuals who are creating our new common coordinate framework. MAP, Atlas's common coordinate frameworks are essential tools for integrating a massive amount of neuroscience data uh, to help us towards understanding how the brain works at molecular, cellular, uh, system and behavioral levels. Um, in this talk, the team will walk you through the creation of our new, fantastic, high-resolution common coordinate framework that will enable us to uh, better map our data and also better analysis and visualization of the data. Uh, please welcome Yan Li, uh, Chen Shen Wang, uh, Josh Rao, and Wayne Reitman. Thank you, Lydia, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yang Li from the technology. In the first section, I'm going to talk about uh, the common space, uh, the cortical coordinate system, and the reference data. So the first question is, why do we need a common, uh, common space? As we all know that, we are generating various type of data uh, towards our 10-year plan. They are different in many ways, especially they are from different modalities and uh, live in different space. Uh, so in order to really unleash the power of big sense and big data, we need a way to integrate all this data together and allow them to talk to each other. So that's the reason back in 2005, we introduced our first version of a common coordinate framework. It's defined uh, based on one single nasal specimen. Uh, and then we register all other data into that space. And by doing that, first, we can have a standardized representation of all the metadata. And secondly, and more importantly, by doing this, all the data across different, uh, different subjects and uh, modalities can now be compared and analyzed. But as you can see, that a single nasal uh, specimen is not a really smooth in 3D. So, uh, this time in version three, we move to another modality called a serial two photon imaging. Since it's a block phase imaging system, so, so now we can stack in together the 2D sections to get a really smooth 3D volume. But uh, beside the 3D smoothness, there's another property we really want our uh, template to have. That is, we want it to be as generic as possible. But if you just choose one brain, no matter how carefully you select it, its unique shape, uh, our imaging artifacts, or even the tissue damage will be introduced as a bias into the system. So this time, instead of using one brain, we build our atlas based on a population of 1,675 mouse brains. And the construction precise start from using the version two atlas as the initial template. So in each iteration, we first uh, register uh, all other images into that template space, and then we do uh, a fine registration uh, to that space, and after that, we compute the average template again and use that to, uh, as a template in next iteration. And we keep doing this until there's little change of the template. And when, when all this converged, we introduce uh, the deformable registration in a similar way. So at the end, what we have is the average template with the average shape and the average intensity. And if you compare this uh, any of the single brain on the left side to the average template we obtain on the right side, you can see that uh, for the unique features that is only belongs to that single brain is no longer readable. Actually, this is a good as a template. But uh, on the other hand, for, uh, for, for the common features shared by most of the brain in the population, they have been greatly enhanced. For example, you can see the barrel field and the barrel is in the brain stem very clearly now. And this two video shows you uh, how this algorithm converged. And they both start from some very fuzzy image and gradually turn into a clear and a sharp image. 
Uh, and the right side is, uh, is an interesting example of applying the same algorithm to our batch photos. You know, when I, when I, when I run this algorithm, I, I really don't know what we're going to say at the end. So when I see this charming face, uh, I feel kind of relieved. <laughs> Allen Institute employee. Yes, yes. Average face, a common face to represent everyone of us. <laughs> uh, this two videos shows you uh, more details about uh, the, uh, the template we obtained. On the right side is the maximum intensity projection that allows you to see uh, more inner structures, and the left side is uh, a go through of the coronal sections. And as you can see, both of them are very clean, beautiful, and full of anatomical uh, details. On top of the CCF, we actually built another uh, infrastructure called a cortical coordinate system. Since a lot of effort will be focused on the cortex, so Lydia gets the idea, why don't we build a local and a curved system just for the cortex? So the idea is, we first uh, compute the Laplacian between the pi and a wet matter surface to generate an equipotential field, which is shown as a color rainbow in figure B, uh, in figure A, sorry. And the streamlines you see in figure B and C are the paths that goes through this uh, equipotential field orthogonally. So with these uh, streamlines, now we can integrate the information between different layers. For example, by doing a maximum intensity projection from inside the brain to the top surface, on the right side, we can see the different patches of the cortex. We can see the uh, barrel field, we can see the somatosensory and the primary visual and uh, auditory areas. And also, on the other direction, you can also project the information from the surface down to the brain, and with that, you can do the so-called surface-based uh, annotation. And later on, Chuan Xing will talk more about this. Uh, data annotation is uh, another very important uh, aspect of the CCF construction. But the information provided by the template itself is not enough. So we also uh, prepared another set of data uh, reference data to aid the annotation. So for each of the uh, data sets, we first uh, stack the uh, uh, sections together, and then we did the rigid uh, registration to get them roughly aligned. And then we, do, uh, we did a deformable registration to get an uh, almost uh, smooth 3D volume. And lastly, we register all this data into the CCF space. And for the same reason, we also prepare another, another set of a transgenic or connectional uh, data sets for the, for the annotation. And all these data are very beautiful by themselves, but uh, their scientific value will be realized in the hand of the neural anatomists. So next, uh, Chuan Xing will talk more about this. Good morning, everyone. Just like uh, uh, Yang talk about uh, how beautiful the, the brain, uh, brain are, oh, uh, we uh, very appreciate the, the new uh, average template uh, he generated. So the Yang talk about uh, why uh, we need next gener generation uh, CCF. Then I, I will talk about uh, how we are going to annotate the mouse, uh, mouse brain structure in 3D space using the average template and the reference, uh, reference data set young generated. <clears throat> so the, the, structure con uh, the structure contains a large, a la large cell and more cells. Uh, it's very bright, uh, brighter in the average template. Then the structure, uh, structure contains less and small cells uh, are darker in the average template. Based on that structure, uh, 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 inherent uh, contrast uh, features, uh, we found uh, more than 120 structures uh, visible on the average template. Then we annotated this structure in first phase. 
Then there are uh, more than half uh, structures we can't see clear, bo clear boundary. Then uh, Hongkui and I, we selected uh, 32 transgenic lines. Uh, we can use this transgenic li line as aid to annotate the structure uh, in, in the average template. <clears throat> so I just saw uh, uh, a few examples here. Uh, this is a kernel plane. You can, uh, you can see the hypothalamus. Then there are a few structures you can see a very clear border, like a uh, third ventricle and the fiber tracks. But the ventral media, ventral media hypothalamus nu nucleus, you, you can see a brighter cloud, but you cannot see clear boundary for this structure. In order to draw a VMH, I load a reference data here, use the reference data as guide, we, uh, I can draw the boundary for a VMH. So this is, this is a wave I draw for a VMH. Then Josh uh, will talk about uh, how uh, to turn this uh, wave into very smooth uh, 3D uh, structure later. <clears throat> so if you open the Paxinos Atlas and the ARA, you will find anti part of the hippocampus here. This region uh, has been annotated as CS3, but based on our uh, template, I draw the dorsal part to CA2, the ventral part to CA3. So this uh, was supported by the gene expression data and the connectivity data. <clears throat> so the, 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 mind, the, the mission of the mind scope is to understand how brain works using visual system as a window. So when we started this uh, project, we wanted to prioritize the visual system, visual, uh, visual air, higher visual areas. <clears throat> so just like Yang talked about, uh, Lydia uh, came up with a, with a, a great idea to draw the cortical area from a surface view you, uh, using the uh, cortical coordinate system. <clears throat> uh, here's the uh, template. So you can see uh, S1, V1, a1 and the racial splenic cortex. Then we load uh, other modality of our data on top of the template. So uh, you, they match perfectly. That means what we see here on the template is not artifact, it's a true uh, structure. So, so we, we can draw this area first. The four, uh, we draw the four area as a cornerstone we lay down the cornerstone, we know the higher visual area for uh, between these areas. But, this, but we still cannot draw higher visual areas based on template alone. We need another kind of modality or data to support, uh, su support us. So Lydia selected 20, 26 uh, V1 injection cases. Use that to make a visual topic map here, be color, color coded uh, for different visual field, the lower field, uh, higher nasal field, uh, higher ten, ten, uh, temper field. Then Lydia select uh, 106 cortical injections uh, make uh, the uh, virtual closure labeling pattern here. <clears throat> Based on these two uh, modality, modality or data, <clears throat> uh, we, we know that the closure labeling pattern and the uh, higher visual area ha has a unique uh, uh, have a unique relationship, uh, be, be a spatial relationship between them. Based on, on that, I can draw the uh, higher visual air areas because each, each individual uh, visual area has a uh, complete visual topic map. So this two, three, uh, this uh, visual areas I draw in, in 2D uh, was translated into 3D volume uh, uh, with the Stream line, or we call it a cortical coordinate system. <clears throat> so, this is a, a, a sagittal view of the uh, uh, average template. You see the gradient of the cortex. 
but you, you can't see the clear border. So it's impossible to draw the layers uh, based only on the tem uh, average template. What we used, we loaded the, the uh, transgenic data. So we have a different lines of transgenic data express, expressing in layer one, two, uh, two, three, four, five, six. And load this data so we can draw uh, the uh, cortical layer throughout the cortex uh, very smoothly. So this is the uh, final product of, of the 3D, uh, 3D uh, view of the uh, each cortical layers, just like a rainbow. <clears throat> Currently, we are using this uh, a, mixture, a mixture of the version two and three uh, CC, uh, CCF uh, for our data presentation on the website. But clearly, you can see uh, the version two uh, structures are jacked, then version three is very smooth on the surface. If you look at it uh, from a horizontal or sagittal, also you can see the difference between the two versions. So jagged structure are version two, then uh, smooth structure version three. So clearly the version three uh, CCF <coughs> will provide uh, better accuracy for data registration, uh, data presentation, and data quantification. <coughs> So in uh, last May, we have released uh, 158 cortical structure, uh, subcortical structure and 15 cortical structures. So the goal for this project, we wanted to uh, annotate 300, 300 gray matter structure. And the, the next, uh, next generation common, uh, common coordinate uh, common framework will provide uh, the solid foundation for multi-data, multi multi-modality, multi-modality data integration. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Josh Royal, and right now I'd like to talk about Atlas production in three-dimensional space. Our process begins with the selection of a 3D annotation platform. And for this um, new version of CCF, we have chosen ITK Snap, whose features include that it's voxel based. And we have chosen a voxel resolution of 10 microns. It's multiplanar, offering horizontal, sagittal, and chronal views simultaneously. And it offers 3D rendering. And all these features allow the integration of multiplanar feedback throughout the drawing process. So aside from the streamlines which build the aerial regions of the cortex, all, the, all other structures that we, we're building that are three-dimensional and smooth and continuous are actually a concatenation of two-dimensional shapes. So traditional 2D atlas, and for example, the, our original Allen reference atlas, you begin with hand section histology with plates chosen at semi-regular sampling intervals. Each of these plates is then drawn by hand in 2D with a program like Illustrator. And these plates can then be brought into a registered 3D space. But that leads to a certain degree of jaggedness in the reconstruction of the cross plane. CCF, this new version, however, starts with the register template, which was mentioned earlier, of course, by Yong. And you can th start to throw in trans, uh, transgenic data and additional transgenic data, which you know, allows one to start to delineate, for example, the dorsal part of the LGN, eventually resulting in brain-wide atlasing. So one question is, how do we get the structure so smooth? So if Chuan Zin showed the, the older version, which looked very jagged in that three-dimensional totality, and the new version is smooth, how do we get there? So we're gonna take the fornix as a little case example. <clears throat> so the first approach is to draw the gestalt and employ an auto-smoothing algorithm. And this is what this would look like. So if we draw every plate in the coronal for the fornix, and we say, okay, the gestalt is good enough, we're, we're gonna leave a little bit of 
lumpy features in the sagittal and horizontal planes, and we're going to employ a back-end smoothing algorithm, what we're left with is something that is indeed smooth, but rather deformed. And I'm just going to repeat that so you can see how it blows the structure out. <clears throat> the second approach, uh, which we're employing, is manual refinement throughout the process. And you can see coronal, sagittal, and horizontal views and the resulting three-dimensional shape are lean, they're smooth, and it's highly accurate. Another question would be, okay, that's great. Now how do we proceed with atlasing? So the first approach, which is, again, a more traditional way of doing things, is to draw plates one at a time. This is what this would look like. There are a couple problems with this, however. One is an orientation commitment. So if we're gonna march plate after plate after plate, drawing every structure, we have to decide is it sagittal, is it coronal, is it horizontal? And then there's a workflow bottleneck. And what I mean by that is, if Chuan Zin is the chief neuroanatomist, he's gonna have to draw everything on one plate before it could be handed to a team of illustrators. And that puts a lot of the upfront work on Chuan Zin, and there's a lot of lag sort of in the workflow. And of course, there's a lack of ongoing 3D feedback, meaning that you'd have to draw a good number of these plates to be able to see how structures are reconstructing th three-dimensionally in the cross-plane. Option two, which is our preferred approach, is to take structures one at a time. For example, start with cataputamen, move on to the globus pallidus, and let's just say the third ventricle. The key features, which is to say improvements over the previous approach, is they have orientation flexibility. So if you're talking like the third ventricle, that could be a, a, a structure that's very, very long in the coronal plane, but very shallow in the sagittal plane. And so it's nice that we can have the option of drawing principally in the sagittal plane with the multiplane viewer, as opposed to a structure like the cataputamen, which might be easier in another orientation, et cetera, et cetera. And there are great re reduced bottlenecks taking structures one at a time. So Chuan Zin can start to define many structures and hand it off to a team of production associates who could do the fill-in and smoothing. And of course, there's ongoing 3D feedback. So there are a couple of practical production problems that we need to address. For starters, there are many structures. We're hoping to get 300, but we're looking if you include cortical structures in excess of possibly 500. And there are many plates. Structures run between four to 600 plates per orientation at this voxel resolution. And there's limited neuroanatomous bandwidth. There's only one Chuen Zin, or for fiber tracks, there's only one Song Lin. So the solution is key framing and filling. This is a two-part process, which I'll explain here. So what is keyframing? So this is a term borrowed from the animated cartoon technique where you have a principal artist who draws a scene and then another scene and then you have associate animators who fill in the plates in between. And this allows people to do what they do best. The principal artist worries about the depiction of the scene, worries about content. The associate animators are worried about doing a lot, you know, a lot of drawing and making things smooth. Our version sort of borrows from this, where Chuen Zin is drawing key frames at regular intervals, and a team of production associates are drawing the in-between frames to get that full concatenated 3D shape. And this is what it looks like in practice. So we're taking CA1 of the hippocampus, and Chuen Zin is drawing the coronal plane every fourth or fifth section, moves on to the sagittal, and then the horizontal. And the result is this waffle-like weave structure. The associates then take one of the orientations, usually the one with the least number of plates, and fill them in to get the full concatenated smooth structure. So there are a couple of strategies for bid building individual structures that I want to talk about briefly. The first is a joining, meaning drawing off existing structures. And for example, the cerebellum. The advantage is here or that you have copied features, meaning you could start with a structure in this large group of structures, and you could immediately draw its adjoining neighbors, allowing you to leverage that common surface, which greatly speeds up time and adds an automatic lock tightness to the end result. 
The disadvantages, however, are that you need to have all your data and analysis done before you can really dig in to the discovery phase and then the final drawing phase. And you have to work, you know, single production associates. You can't have a team of people doing this fill-in process on individual files and then hope to build, bring them together for absolute seamlessness. So the alternative, which we employ more typically, is building in isolation. So we're looking at the midline, and the midline, and these are just some random structures that we've built. And the advantage is that you have fewer timing issues, and associates can work in parallel. And what's nice about this approach is, you know, if, if we're starting with a template and we want to draw what's evident in the template, we can start right away. If we're waiting for a transgenic line, we can defer drawing those structures that rely on that until they, they become available. So it's a nice workflow sort of system. The disadvantages, of course, you don't have the, the surface copy benefits that you had, for example, in the cerebellum, and the lock tightness that you hope to get from borrowing surfaces is deferred till later. And I'll get into that with our final consideration which is bringing separate builds together for maximum seamlessness. So the method we employ, because it is ultimately the most, one of the most important stages, building a finished, smooth, Loctite, brain-wide final product, is what we call holistic form fitting. This is kind of a little vignette of what it looks like. So we have an initial macro merge. So these are individual structures. Look at just at the dorsal part of the thalamus, where the box is. And so we've, we brought those individual files together, the three-dimensional shapes, and we've, we've put them in, in one file. And what you end up inevitably is with boundary gaps and overlaps. And these are corrections that get defined by Chuen Zin and then carried out by the team of production associates. And the philosophy here that allows this and makes, makes a lot of sense is that individual structures at this point are anatomically well anchored. The macro merge is itself a line of evidence and a consistent application of fine-level interpretation of, say, the very shades of gray or the fuzzy, the slight fuzziness of the transgenic data can be applied at the end best because it's consistent. And after form fitting, we're missing a few structures here, but you could see that uh, compared to the initial macro merge, things are a lot more locked tight. And so this concludes my portion. Uh, to date, we have 257 structures, which is about 100 more than we had in the May release. And with that, I will turn it over to Wayne Wakeman, who will talk about a very interesting use case scenario. My name is Wayne Wakeman. I'm a project manager in the Information Technology Group. I'm going to give a brief example of how we've applied the CCF to one of our large-scale um, data projects here at the Institute. So just to reiterate, reiterate a point that Jan made to begin with, um, uh, CCF, creating a CCF at this scale is very expensive, so let's, uh, let's talk about what we get for it. Um, for one thing, we get very accurate modeling of cellular responses at different areas and at different cortical layers. Uh, we will be able to integrate this data with other data modalities and other projects that are going on right now and also in the future. And then also, as you can see here, we're able to make very accurate visualizations of the cells within the mouse brain. So I want to call out the uh, Cell Types project. This is released on the brainmap.org website uh, back in May, and that was the front page. This is the, uh, the top left corner of that. What you're seeing here is the uh, visual area of the mouse brain. Each one of those dots is one of the cells that was characterized with electrophysiology, and some of them had uh, morphology as well. And they've been mapped into a very accurate location using the CCF. And all the uh, graphs on the side and below are like a side view, so you can also see where that cell lies uh, within the uh, cortical layer structure. In order to map each one of those cells, we had to collect some additional data. So the first one, represented in the upper left, is a series of block face images uh, that were collected of the mouse brain as part of the process. Uh, we took those, and that provides the uh, global context to map into the CCF. Uh, a lot of the cells got a high resolution image stack represented in the lower right. And to connect those, we also had to collect one additional image, which was a, a 20x image of that um, 
of the brain where we collected that cell. And then we were able to use specific uh, registration techniques and alignment to map individual cells all the way back to the CCF. But there was one key element that was still missing. Uh, the whole process required a, some manual input where some of our expert annotators drew polygons that represented the PIA, the soma, and the white matter on several of those images. And that allowed us to do this landmark-based alignment. That was the way that we could align these images of very different scales to one another and make this mapping possible. So using that process, we were able to assign over 600 cells to a position in 3D space with very high accuracy. And that will allow us in the future to connect the data that we've, we've collected for this project to other projects as well so that we can, we can connect this knowledge with other knowledge that will be collected in the future and in the end learn more about how the brain works. So the four of us have presented this, but it's obviously a huge team project. I want to take a moment to acknowledge everyone in the Institute that's contributed to this and uh, to thank Paul Allen for making it possible for us to do this important work. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. So I understand this is um, the third real version that you're working on now, the CCF. Um, is that going to be the final version? And, and how are you going to know when you're done? I, I used a final version for the space, so the average template, because it's a three, almost a three-year effort to annotate it. So I think the space is done. Um, and then we have our own milestone of getting a broad coverage over the brain uh, in that three years. But it's one of those things that you can annotate more, you can add more data to it, that sort of thing. But I think as a space, I think we need to lock that down because each time you change the space, it brings along this um, large scale annotation process. So, so the, you think you've got the space pretty much locked down and now what you'll be doing is putting data as it gets collected or has been collected yep. into that space. Yes. Thanks. Can you hear me? Um, to what extent um, are individual cortical areas genuinely well-defined as opposed to sometimes having overlapping uh, boundaries? I've heard, for example, that in mouse, th these things are just not as discrete as, as they are uh, in, in the human brain, and I wonder how much, I guess that's a question for you, um, how, how sensitive the methods are to the, the differing possibilities there, and also how consistent it is, say, within the human brain or within a mouse brain. I think the mouse brain is a very tiny. You better go to the board. The mouse brain is very tiny. There are, uh, like you said, there are overlap. For example, a motor area, motor one and then motor two. If you do the trigger injection, you can see that the, at the border is mixed together. So if you look at the monkey data, uh, David Foundation, he, he uh, studied an, a neural anatomy out of monkey. Usually, uh, he draw the uh, transition zone between area. Only we one, he draw a clear boundary. Uh, rest of the brain is not that They don't have a clear boundary. But anyway, we artificially uh, draw the boundary. For example, I draw the visual area based on the leader's uh, visual topic map. If you don't use this map as a guide, you, there's no way you, you can draw a boundary. I, I don't, I don't uh, say uh, the boundary I draw is 100% correct, but basically you, you, you use, uh, I lost it. So you can use the landmark even if it isn't a crisp landmark, essentially. So you, you can sort of make the best guess at a, almost like a hypothesized, a putative landmark in order, in yeah, order yeah, to yeah. guide what you're doing. Yeah, that's this correct. Okay. Yeah.
Um, so these maps are average data. I wonder, is there a way to include confidence bounds in um, in the rendering process? Because you know that would be potentially helpful for people in the community to know to what degree of confidence do you think this is the LGN versus VPM versus um, other cortical structures, thalamic structures. I think uh, the way is. Uh, rely on how you generate the data. If you generate the data the same way like we generate, use the tissue side, I think it's, uh, the, the Yang did perfect registration. I used the transcending light to overlay. The barrel match barrels almost perfectly. So I don't think there are a, a large variability between the, the, the data. Well, the gap data, I mean, there, was, there, there were the fill-in gap data uh, that you presented. That seems to be somewhat variable. Uh, y yes, we at the time we don't have the transgenic line. Uh, this is the first phase. Uh, we only rely on the template itself. Some areas no sharp border, like LGN. Then we uh, we can draw roughly. Then, then we do do the uh, fine uh, fine tuned ad adjustment later. Because right now we have a 32 transgenic line we can use to make it more precise. It on? Yeah. Should I get my hopes up that the spinal cord is next? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's well. First thing was that to build a um, specimen, we actually leverage of our connectivity atlas. That's where the thousand six hundred and seventy-five specimen comes from. And uh, you know, as Christoph presented at the beginning, there's that singular focus that the team is all rowing their boat against, and it is in the cortex. So I think our emphasis is going to be the cortex and the visual system. Right. So, any questions? I'd like to thank the team uh, for the presentation. Uh, it is coffee break now, and everybody should come back at 10.45 for the first virtual tour. <laughs>